those of you that don't know, my name is Michael Latranya. Um, I'm an artist. I just graduated from Brockport uh, College, getting my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, uh, concentrating in photography. Um, in August, in the fall, I'm going to actually start my master's degree at Visual Studies. So, the big thing for me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I mainly do photography, obviously. I do a little um, mixed media with some uh, sculptural stuff, combining photography with objects and um, different types of printing processes. So, here we go. Come on. Okay, so I'm going to be showing you guys some of my older work first, and we'll make our way up to some of the newer stuff that I work on now, okay? Okay, so when I started at Brockport, I was doing a lot of macro stuff, macro photography, and uh, Kitty was very supportive of me for that, and um, she helped me actually get in contact with the uh, insect department at school, and they had a collection of um, different insects, moths, butterflies, mantises, all sorts of bugs. And so I took the time and I wanted to uh, learn different techniques I could for photographing them since they're such small objects. I knew it was a little more difficult. I ended up coming up uh, and finding the process of focus stacking. For those of you that don't know what focus stacking is, it's basically taking multiple images at varying depths of focus so you start with the closest area, focus in, take a picture, and move out, take a picture, and just keep moving along your object. Take all those images. I usually get around 20 to 35, sometimes 40, depending on uh, how the, the object is angled. Um, anyways, once you get all those images, you bring them into Photoshop. You combine them with a couple different techniques uh, through Photoshop has some pre-made features that'll allow you to basically connect all that together, but then some of it you have to do on your own with, you know, different fix-ups here and there because not everything's perfect for it. But once you're done, you get these type of images where there's perfect depth of field from front to back of the um, object. So obviously, as you can see as well, I didn't remove any dust or anything from the insects through Photoshop or real life. I wanted to leave all that dust, show the age of the insects. Some of the insects have pieces missing on them. They're slowly decaying just because they're old. Um, so this um, series I called Larger Than Life, I actually printed these images at a larger scale of 22 inches by 28 inches. So that I could have an insect that was larger than the person viewing it basically to give a new experience of seeing this insect up close. Um, so there's those two, which is the mantis and a giant flag moth. And then, come on. And then there's also the giant leopard moth. These are just a few. In total, I actually ended up with like five or six of these large prints. So, but these were the three that I liked the most and I've enjoyed looking at myself personally and people have had questions about and things like that, so. Does anyone have questions about the insect stuff? Is that a native bug? So some of these insects are native, not to New York. The, uh, the collection at the school was actually created by a gentleman. Um, he created this collection because he was interested in bugs through his whole life. And he ended up working at a science building, basically, where they sold science equipment, things like that. And over time, he basically made connections and was like, hey, I'll trade you this insect for this one because they he didn't travel too much and made a giant collection of these. There's hundreds upon hundreds of insects in this collection. Some are, there's multiple of some and then others, there's only one. So, yeah. Well, Michael, what, I'm sorry. This is, this is Jen, I have a question. I was just wondering like, what is the, yeah. you know, I'm not um, really great with Photoshop and I feel that each time that mm -hmm. I attempt to do something, it's a pretty <laughs> tedious process in terms of learning as I go. So I'm imagining yep. that, you know, to have a resulting body of work of six images probably took a long time. Could you give some insight into how long you worked on each image between making each different you know, like between doing 20 to 40 individual images and then connecting them all together. Like what's the investment of time for each image? 
So in total for this project, this was a couple weeks in total. Uh, each image, so what I did is this collection was basically in the back of one of the schools. So each Friday, I basically would go there and I would hike all my equipment into this tiny room that was probably from the 80s because it had a very old paint job, nothing looked like it was ever changed. Hiked all my equipment in there and I would just take insect after insect out and I would photograph them. So they actually have a pin that goes through the middle of them because they're in boxes and cases. I did Photoshop out that, but what I did is I clamped on, um, basically for soldering, there's little tools that you can clip onto the wires. I used one of those to hold the pin, so then I could change the angle. So first off, I would sit there and just adjust the angle over and over and over again until I got what I wanted and what I thought, okay, this is gonna make a good photograph from this angle or from the top, bottom, whatever worked for me. Then I had to take the time, set up my tripod and everything right in front of it start get my focus all my lighting correct because I had just you know little flashes that I could set up on a table that they had in the room get all my lighting correct so you know that's good 20 30 minutes right there of the time and then I'd actually start taking the images and I'd have to take a picture of it you know focus in take another picture focus take a picture focus take a picture focus take a picture they make equipment you can buy that you basically click it one time and it'll just do it by itself I didn't have that, so I basically would bring my hand close to it, wouldn't touch it, use the remote, clicked it, adjusted a little, clicked it, adjusted a little, clicked it, and I kept doing that. And most of them I did once. Sometimes if I saw there was more detail, more layers, I would do it twice through, which would obviously increase the amount of time it would take. So that's just not even the Photoshop part of it. Once that happened, then I would go into Photoshop, layer it all, so there's five or six steps just to get it layered into one image. Because all it does really is make layer masks on every single layer, getting rid of any pixels that are out of focus. So that right there, it takes some time because it takes time loading. And then I had to adjust any of my other settings that I wanted, which you know I took was tedious at that, trying to get everything set perfectly. And I would also within that time as well, do my adjustments on if maybe like an area was slightly blurry just because of the process, it's not perfect. You adjust little sections and fix it. So in, all in all, each image, if you go from going to take the pictures and creating them, I'd say each one in total is maybe 40 minutes to an hour long process but I would do batches. So I'd do all the images one day, and then I'd do maybe two insects. I'd do the stacks, and then do the edits for them, and so on, and then move on to the next insects and stuff like that. I did multiple insects, but six were the only ones that I actually printed. So I did probably in total 20 insects I photographed in this process in a way, so. And how was your luck handling these very Sorry, I think there's two people. It was talking. very okay. So I was going to say, how was your luck handling these very old bugs with them not deteriorating as you handled them? You know, being at somebody else's collection, how was that experience? It was very different because you could feel the insects. Obviously, they're dried out in the process to make them last. And so you can, even just picking them up, they weigh nothing. You can't feel anything. So the easiest way I found was to just grab it by the pin and try to move it around and not actually touch the insect itself. Because I actually did have one insect where the wing broke off. Good thing was they had a second one. So, <laughs> but they're very light and very fragile. Because when I was looking through the insects too, even for some of them, they didn't touch. You could see the flakes of their skin, their wings were breaking off. Some of them were missing antenna just because of how dried out and fragile they were as a specimen. Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to the next thing. So after the insects, I was still doing my macro photography with the focus stacking. I moved on to more playful, I guess, because a lot of the reactions I got from the insects is people were grossed out, a little scared, because they were, you know, larger than <laughs> most people's heads and looks like something out of a horror movie, like it would eat you or something. 
So I did something a little more playful. And again, this was with projects we were doing in class, things like that. But I kind of went in a different direction with the way I did mine. So I did, um, so at like the fairs and things like that, people do model trains. They make the little figurines. They're actually called, um, you know, these ones in particular are called host scale figurines. There's like six or seven different scales for model trains. I wanted to use these and create more of a, like they have a world inside of our world where they're with normal objects that we'd see every day or see, you know, around town, whatever. And they're just interacting like it's regular day for them. So I actually did about nine of these in total. And I made a book of them, which I actually have with me as well. So little book, I made it out of wood. It's hand stitched. So nice little thing I tried to do. Um, same idea, focus stacking. So forward to back. These ones actually took even longer than the insects because I had to set up every one of these little sceneries. So like with the broccoli one, I basically took a piece of cardboard, dumped dirt on it, and then I had to use the uh, asparagus and broccoli. I had to use toothpicks and stab each one of them in and figure out exactly where it was going to be placed for the light to hit the objects right, to hit the figurines right. Same with all of these because I had to take the time with you know my fingers and try to be as delicate as I can and maybe use a little pencil or something to kind of get something to stay where I wanted it to. It wasn't the easiest thing, that's for sure. Um, there's some more as I keep talking. Um, and yeah, each one I tried, I only had so many figurines, but I tried to do as many different, you know, ideas and possibilities as I could from like different ideas, different walks of life in a way, some farming, some, you know, wood stuff, some maybe some city type stuff, painting, whatever. I tried to do a couple different things to get different appearances and things like that. And so, and I made the book out of wood to give it that homemade appearance as well. Um, with that playful look, I added on the cover actually, which I don't know if you'll be able to see. I added, ooh, it's somewhere, there we go, little figurines to make it look like they were painting and making the cover themselves. So the whole book is designed like that in the way that it's playful and I wanted it to be happy and cheery compared to the insects ones which are a little darker and grittier and a little, a little more creepy for people. <laughs> do you mind holding up your book cover again? I'd love to see that again. Yes, I do. Yeah. So there's the figurine right here. He's on a little, you know, piece of wood painting the sign. And then there's the one down here painting the actual wall. So you can see it's actually made out of wood still. <laughs> really good. Yeah. I love the title, Small Town. And Since you're on the screen, you're in a tiny and little box right now, so it's harder to see. Oh, right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There's that one. And then, if I can find him, <laughs> that one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Those are awesome. Yeah, so I had to take the time and photograph those little figurines as well just to get them you know, in the right position I wanted. And the one that's hanging from the string, I actually had to make a stand and hang this string figurine down <laughs> as the right background and photograph it. And then, you know, cut it all out and stuff. Any questions about this stuff? I don't know if you were able to see the Zoom chat, Michael, but there is a comment that says, Norman Rockwell's son is famous for this sort of thing, and he had a mass mocha exhibit at one point. I think, in general, Ooh. most of us agree we like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to write that down. I didn't know that. Jarvis Rockwell? I guess his name is. Yeah, Jarvis Rockwell is the name of the kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I have seen like similar stuff where they're using figurines like this, but every single one that I've seen so far. It's simple backgrounds. They usually do like a white piece of paper, a black piece of paper, and it's just the figurines and the object themselves. There's no really showing that it's in our world or anything. It's like its own world sitting somewhere, who knows where. And I personally didn't like that look for all the ones I've seen. I wanted that groundedness in our world and you could see this. Even like all the 
tables and things like that that they're on, I basically made small platforms that I could just switch out for each one. So I used pallets, I made boards, I used regular like Luan, I used some desk type material, I used a bunch of different things to make these different surfaces that they could sit on so they all had different textures and different appearances and ways. I'm glad you actually wrote that down because you explained that you were creating a world. It didn't occur to me to contrast with that. Now that you say it, the ones I've seen before have mostly been that very like um, advertising commercial, you know, set up. I love your hairbrush one particularly. <laughs> That's amazing. A, a lot of people like that one just because it's the cute one with, you know, the cows and <laughs> just, I tried to get creative with the names as well, just so that it was fun as well. Just I, like I like it because it's textured. <laughs> it has texture because the hay, you know, so. Yep. Yeah, and like with that one, I tried to bend some of the pieces because it's, you know, brushes are stiff. I tried to bend them, give them a little twist, whatever I could with them, so. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, this may have overlapped with the show we went to see at Eastman Museum of David Leventhal's work. That was actually after this project, after strangely okay. enough. Yeah, <laughs> it had been before. I, I, you know, you just put your own spin on it. It has yep. a completely different message, and that playfulness really comes across, which which was helpful to your to your peers. It was freaked out by the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was interesting because everyone in class had different reactions. So, <laughs> especially put up on a giant projector screen or put on the walls next to where everyone was sitting. So, <laughs> anything else about these ones? Can you turn that down? Thank you. Any other questions about my small town work? No. No? Okay. Let's keep going. So now we're actually getting into the stuff I created for my, um, my Bachelor of Fine Arts thesis. I was doing a lot of questioning of myself because I actually learned um, I have what's called um, aphantasia. It's the inability to visualize imagery. So basically people, you know, in your life, you think about memories and you get an image in your head or you see something, whatever. I basically don't. Whatever's around me, that's all I see. That's all I hear. That's so different. And it was, it was interesting finding that out on my own because then I was just confused a little bit of how is this happening? Why is it this way? What am I seeing differently? What am I thinking differently? Um, so I was, it was a little different. Then um, I started to, you know, accept it a little and wanted to go in a different direction. Kitty started showing us new processes such as lumen printing, which is what is here. Um, so I actually started to work with the lumen printing and really kind of took off with it. I started working with the idea of memory and this imprinting of the objects. Um, tried to get a, incredible detail like I had in my other images because the more detail there is, advanced colors, things like that, the easier it is for me to remember it. It's basically when I try to recall something, it's just in, I guess the best way to say it is like words or phrases. I wouldn't see an image, but I'd hear, you know, like colorful, bright, blue, whatever, different details like that, but not seeing it in my head. Um, so this is, you know, a simple process. If for any of you that don't know lumen printing, you use, um, photo paper for a darkroom. You use objects you can find in your house, nature, whatever you really want. You set it on top of the paper and you leave it out in the sun for a period of time. It can be colored paper, it can be black and white, whatever you really want it to be. Uh, each paper will have a different effect. I then took that paper and I actually scanned it in because the, um, the sunlight, so I'll go back a little bit. The sunlight itself is your developer basically for the paper. And then all you have to do is use fixer on it. You don't have to use stop bath or anything else. You just use fixer basically. Fix the image, do a water wash and you're done. Um, so I actually then scanned in the objects, uh, the prints using a scanner, regular Epson scanner. And I used some of the features that the scanners had that actually enhanced the colors to this point where you can see them where it gave them more color, a little more depth, uh, texture. It basically brought out all the different things that I was trying to do with my focus stacking as well. Um, 
So all so my Memento Mori series, like I said, I was kind of on the idea of memory and remembering because I was, you know, stuck with that idea of how do I remember stuff if I can't see it. So I started working with objects that I found. I went on hikes just to kind of breathe and think. And I collected objects as I was out and about, you know. And then I took these objects and I photographed them in different ways. This bottom one in the left corner is actually, I burned flowers. So I did different things like that as well. I got stuff wet. I was burning things. I was breaking it. I was getting different liquids on there. Like I tried lemon. I tried water. It rained for one of them, things like that. And it creates different effects as well. So here's a couple more. The one on the left, I basically sprinkled water across it. Um, just tried to experiment. It went through some of the flowers, sat on top of other ones. Some of the flowers just soaked it up. It's different things. So I used, as you can see in the first two, there were some mushrooms and a flower. Uh, and the one on the left here, it's um, weeds, bones, and a feather. The one on the right is then weeds, a feather, and a butterfly. So each object, depending on how thick it is, how it's curved, the light would affect it in different ways as well. Michael, can um, you talk about yeah. what you did with the bones? <laughs> what I did with the bones? In order to make them, because lumen printing, is, it's not just uh, sensitive to UV, but also to heat. <laughs> yep. So with not with these ones. I'll actually get to that in a sec. Yeah. So these are more. I'll get to the thing you were talking about in a sec, Kitty. Okay. So the one on the left is actually pine cones, and then I burned the paper as well and let it burn for a short period of time. And that, as you can see, scanned in as blues and dark blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the left side is actually a bird's nest and some bird's bones. But yeah, uh, so this is what Kitty was talking about. The one on the right is what it looks like before it's scanned into the computer. The one on the, and enhanced, the one on the left is after everything. So the one on the left, it's all bones, and then there's some weeds sticking out from the skull. It actually started to rain. So the heat from the rain, because it was a humid day, turned into a green, as you can see. And then the bones, to actually make them show up better, the top bone on the right is actually, I heated it up with a blowtorch and then just set it on the paper. So it creates more vibrant yellows and whites compared to just these regular blues and purples that kind of showed up in there. So, yeah. Any questions about this process? It's a little different. <laughs> Was this all color paper that you used then, or black and white paper? So this was a warm tone paper, but it was still a black and white warm tone. So as you can see on the right, even the black and white papers, it gives it some color, not much. It's more of yellows and violets just because of, it doesn't have you know too much. But once I put it through the scanner and use some of the features that it has in the scanner, it creates the more vivid colors and gives it, changes it to the blues and greens, things like that. It's beautiful work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this was, it, it kind of helped me, you know, understand more about myself because I was, I didn't have to think about some of it. I just experimented and let loose and got to breathe and think about it and just watch it happen, I guess. I have a question. Yeah. Clearly, you're a very visual person. You're visual art. So mm -hmm. I find that so strange, like that your memories aren't visual as well. And how did you figure out that you had this? So my family was actually on vacation in Niagara Falls. It's a little weird. Uh, my <laughs> girlfriend is an anthropology major. She was taking a psychology class because she had to. And she was learning about this. And she started telling me. And I just kind of sat there. And my jaw just slowly dropped. Because I was like, what are you talking about seeing images? Like, and I was just so confused. Because I always thought, you know, when people are like, oh, visualize this. I always thought it was kind of like a metaphor. Because no one really explains that or really talks about that being an actual thing. They just... I don't know, it's kind of a thing. In, in movies, I just assumed when people were having these visions or whatever, that it was kind of just them showing it in a way, since you don't want to just sit there and watch someone staring off into nothing. So it was, it was a weird experience for me. 
and I've looked up research and I've done, there's some tests you can take on the computer because I don't know who I would even go to to actually get physically tested for that. So I've taken some tests on the computer and things like that. And most of them, yeah, they've said that. And what I've also learned is that there's different like levels of visualization. Like some people can vividly like see an image perfectly. Other people might be slightly blurry, whatever. And then, you know, there's scales and then the lowest one is basically not seeing anything at all. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it was interesting trying to get used to that because then I was just thinking about, oh, I'll never be able to like fully remember my memories in that sense where I won't be able to see people I've met or like remember people I've lost or anything like that, so. What I love about you, like you really proved yourself technically in your earlier work with the focus stacking, the macro and working out the lighting and really becoming proficient in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this kind of work became more intuitive where like in each step you kind of responded to what was happening. And I think this work made me understand that anaphasia or <laughs> I mean I still I like I'm still I know I, I always mess it up too <laughs> I'm still in denial about it because you were so visual but um maybe that you can't pre-visualize or recall visually is what makes your um attentiveness to what's happening when you're working whether it is with a digital camera in photoshop or with this basic photogramming process is, is really remarkable Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely, I started feeling that myself just because once I, you know, realized I had this and I started thinking about like, because you guys, you know, I always had to make the artist statements for the Bachelor of Fine Arts for the BFA program. All that, I had to make artist statements, all this stuff, explain why I do stuff, what it is I'm doing. And I started to really think and I was like, this is starting to make more and more sense. I take the time, I move each object because I can't just visualize how I want to place everything. So I move every single object around multiple times and then I'm, I look at it from various angles. I move the whole board, whatever I'm working with. And I'm like, okay, this is what I want to work with. This is what I'm going to stick with. And I, a lot of times I'll like take the objects and I pick them up and I just turn them around by themselves. I'll feel the object. I just really try to look at it and understand like what shadows are going to hit where, what light is going to hit where, how it's going to bounce around it, whatever. That's so interesting. And maybe maybe it's kind of good in a way because like if if you ever saw something traumatic, you won't be able to like replay it in your mind over and over. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. To, you know, I've thought about some things like that. I'm like, okay, it's not bad. But then the, the main part where it's been getting me is um, I'll actually get to that for the next project is for um, like my grandparents and stuff like that because I have lost um, most of them except one. And it's trying to remember them, and think about what memories I have with them and things like that. So, anything else about these ones? Okay. So these are the ones I was basically explaining. I did another series after the um, Memento Mori called Family Remembrance. It's a total of six um, lumen prints three for each side, one for my mom's side, one for my dad's side. And what there is, is there's a photo of both of my grandparents on my mom's side together. And then one of my grandpa, one of my grandma. And then it's the same with my dad's side. One of the couple, one of the grandpa, one of my grandma. So, and what I did with these is for the combined photos, I did the favorite flower of my grandma's. So for this one, um, it's my mom's side. She loved carnations. Every time my grandpa gave them to her, she loved them. Uh, every time anyone gives them to her now, she basically tears up because he's gone. Um, but, and what I did is I actually did the number of carnations is the number of children they had. So they had seven children. So there's seven carnations in this image. And the image in the middle is that one. And it's actually a picture of them on their wedding day. So the image to the right is obviously of my grandpa and the image to the left is of my grandma. For those ones, I used objects or things that maybe I associated with them or what they liked. 
things like that. So for my grandpa, he loved fishing. So I did lures, bobbers, all this stuff. And I did like reeds, garden type, you know, stuff you'd find around water's edges, things like that. Because he loved fishing, loved hanging out with me and my brother and fishing with us and things like that. Uh, the little white dot in the middle actually is a penny. Uh, he used to throw pennies on the ground when me and my brother weren't looking and say, oh look, there's pennies from heaven. So whenever we find change on the ground now, we say it's from Poppy. So it's, it's one of those things that that's where I'm kind of sad. I can't see the images in my head because I can't picture these memories, but I know they happened. So things like that, it's just the object itself is really imprinted on me in a sense. So that, you know, I think about it and I'm like, oh, I, he used to love doing that or he does this or whatever. Um, it's the same with my grandma, she's still alive. But she had, did all the art, and she taught me how to draw a little and things like that. So I did a pencil, and I was a very shy child. I didn't like to do new things, anything like that. So she used to teach me different games, card games, board games, whatever. So I did some playing cards on there for her as well. And then some more um, flowers just to uh, help with that one as well. She, she got to see all of these as well, and she loved them. It made her super happy. And I learned new things from them too, because I actually used family photographs that she gave me. So these were old film photos that she had just sitting in a box in the house that she didn't ever use, didn't look at, didn't have anything to do with. So I kind of put them back into something that I'm making new with a process that I have kind of changed to be mine in a sense to that it works for me and it's bringing out these new colors and details that most people probably haven't seen from it. And I even learned something at the show, the picture of my grandfather, apparently the fish he's holding up is one she caught. <laughs> so little things, it, it makes a big difference. And it's funny just to hear that story from her and learn that they went out fishing and he just took her fish as his photo. <laughs> <laughs> so then this is my dad's side, same idea, couple parents. Uh, hers were asters, those were her favorite flowers. They only had three kids, so there's three asters. The photo that they have in this one, again, they're all family photos. Um, this one is actually of them on a cruise because they used to love doing cruises. They did photo things together. They would dress up for all this stuff. That's what they just like doing. Um, so my grandma on the left, she, you know, again, they're asters in there. She liked um, Carousel horses, I don't know why, but she liked carousel horses. She always had them around the house. They were, she had a campsite, they were all over the place. So I put a small miniature horse. Um, the blob in the left corner is actually a small doll. She had lots of dolls around her house as well because she said it was haunted by a little girl. It's a little weird, but it's something I remember about her and it's very vivid. <laughs> And the feather actually represents, she was part of the um, historical society in Greece and things like that. She was a big historian. She loved to learn about stuff. And that's how she learned about the haunting of the little girl and stuff. <laughs> she actually looked up the history of her house and all this stuff and had it all in her mind. <laughs> I think that also has helped influence me and the idea of I want to see my past and I'm using these old objects that they have and I'm trying to kind of represent them now and sense that I'm seeing them of what they were and what they are now of um, that yeah my grandfather he was in the military uh, the Marines to be exact so I used his dog tags and actually his um, Marines patch and then he after that he came out of the Marines he ended up working for the post office so I used some stamps and things like that that reminded me of him he was a very simple person more laid back very relaxed <laughs> basically just Yep, I'll do it, <laughs> whatever. He was a very nice guy too, so. With the inclusion of the photographs, it gives them a feel of collage. Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. Can you say how you incorporated the photographs into it? <laughs> so this was a very interesting process as well. I'll actually go back to this. So the one of my grandparents, their marriage photo in the middle. I basically created a digital negative. I got the idea from uh, Bin Don when he did his leaf prints and things like that. I created a digital negative, printed that out. And after the original lumen print was done, 
I then put this over top of it and print it again, and it printed their image onto it. So that's part of the process. Some of them, it didn't work as well just because of how the colors are placed from the spray of the water and things like that. So then I also might've done some layering in Photoshop, but most of them, it's their actual film basically is placed right over it and it's printing itself. So you're saying it's like a double exposure or double developer yep. development. So basically I, I did it the first time and I didn't put it through the fixer. I just put it back in the bag to house it for the time being. And then when I got a chance, I did it with the digital negative. And to control this process a little more, normal, like I said with the uh, Memento Mori series, is that you use sunlight. Instead of using sunlight, I actually created my own exposure unit. I created an enclosed box, basically, that I could cover up and completely seal off. And I used just some little LED black lights in there. And I was able to create the same wavelength as sunlight. It's just a more controlled because I could turn it off whenever I wanted. And it wasn't moving across the sky and changing the angles. It was just straight down. Fascinating and impressive. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I try to do a lot of hands-on processes, if you folks can't tell. I try to do something where I build with my hands or move something around so I'm getting that, that touch, that feel of moving it and actually thinking about what I'm doing. So. Okay. Michael, I just have one more question, which is, you know, it just came to me when you were talking about the movement of the sun. So mm -hmm. I kind of envision that a lot of times when people are making like anthrotypes or lumen prints or things that they are putting them in a printing frame so that the glass actually is pressing the item flat against it. But in your case, it sounds like you're just laying the items there in their regular 3D shape. And then as the sun moves, you're going to get the shadows or what maybe appears like movement or blurring, which really affects and improves, I think, the, um, uh, the end effect. Um, is that true? Yep. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So like yeah, you, can, you can see in this one with the bone, it looks, you can see like the double or triple layering of the bone on the skull on the actual like femur here different things like that you can see how the sun kind of moved across the sky and like you said i it is a nice way of layering because you can see where the water kind of seeped around the bone but it looks like the bones over it things like that it does give it a nice look i just used the box for these ones because i wanted that crisp image of the people and the objects themselves so it didn't look like it was moving it was just solid images solid objects so it was easy to kind of understand what they were in a sense what was your exposure time on these do lumen prints take a super long time especially with uh, the, so with the uv unit mm -hmm. so the ones outside they were probably about an hour maybe two hours depending on what it was the weather was like because I didn't want too much movement that it blurred since I had thick objects and they weren't flat um, for the UV unit though I was able to do like some of them I actually just left it in overnight and just the next morning when I woke up I went downstairs shut the unit off and pulled everything out but then some other ones when I wanted more control such as like a thicker object or whatever I might have actually like timed myself and gone down, checked it here, looked to see what it looked like, and then closed the unit back up and left it for more time or whatever it worked. So I was kind of like a, whatever I saw and I thought was the best image I could get while looking at it was what I went with time-wise. And was this uh, the one you have on the screen right now? Were you using spray, like spraying on it? Yep, so as you can see on the left one, and then the right one the most is I basically just got like a cleaner bottle, filled it with water. Some of it was cold water and some of them I did warm water to give different effects. And then I would change the angle of the spray. Some of them I did like really close to the paper. Other ones I backed up and I just did a couple squirts and see where it went. And then maybe did a few more to fill it in or whatever really worked best. I just experimented. So I even had, while I was doing my lumen prints the first time for the Memento Mori series, I even had papers that I literally just like 
dripped water on or I sprayed water on or I burned or whatever. They didn't have objects on them. I was just experimenting to see how the light, the heat, all that stuff would affect it. So I had some experimenting to get an understanding of what I could get from it. I really love the fact that they feel so experimental, but each one is so successful. Almost like, you know, a lot of times when you're in the dark room and you're trying to get the right exposure and you print the same thing over and over and over and over and over. Yep. And, you know, because of the way that you're laying objects on and dripping water on, each one's going to be different. Did you actually end up making a wider body of lumen prints and then you selected from the ones that you really liked in order to be able to put the photographs over the top? Or... Right, because it seems sort of like the, I don't know, for me looking at them, the placement of the photographs with the particular way the lumen print came out with the shapes and the colors and sort of space for you to see details and faces and hair and clothing. It's, it's seems like more than just good luck. <laughs> so I thought about doing that and I knew that I was going to go through a lot of paper doing that. So what I actually did is I instead of scanning it, because scanning it before the pages were fixed would have changed the way it looked. I actually photographed each lumen print and then scanned in the film and then layered it and moved it around the lumen print until I found a placement where it would work because of obviously it prints better on the lighter areas. So I basically place their faces and things like that, or tried to place them in a spot that would work the best in that sense. And then once I, I did a couple, you know, in Photoshop, I had maybe three for each, whatever, four. They, it kind of varied depending on the shape of the, like how they were standing, the print itself, things like that. I basically moved them around, but instead of doing it by hand, like I normally do with stuff, I did it on the computer. Awesome. Really impressive. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. So this also came around the same time as my lumen printing of the family um, remembrance series. So on my mother's side, my great grandfather was actually in World War One. He was in the Corps of Engineers. And my grandma, along with all those old film, she gave me an album that he made from when he was in the war of traveling around and he took all these pictures. It's an album with probably 30 pages and they're both double-sided and there's five or six images on each page, different things like that. So I just kept looking through this. I showed him all the kitty and we just looked through them and I wanted to do something with them to remember these and not just stuff them away in a box to store. Um, so I kept looking through them and ones that jumped out at me I thought about what I could do with them. I've done other projects where I've actually printed onto objects. I used those insect ones for my Larger Than Life series and I actually did cross sections of logs and printed them onto them. So that it, basically they're embedded in the log in a sense. Um, so for these, I actually did um, a acrylic medium adhesive. So, you know, you just transfer it right over for the ink from the page to the object. So I picked different images for different objects. The one on the left, the ammunition can, uh, it's hard to tell, but the image is actually of a, um, it's a battlefield graveyard basically. So it's all the tombstones. There's, it's a dark picture because it was a cloudy day, which I think kind of worked for it. And what I did is I placed that ammo can in dirt. I had it partially opened and I actually had gunfire and screaming and different things like that coming from the ammo can, but I made it very low and quiet so you wouldn't hear it until you got right next to the ammo can and had to look up close at the image and could hear the sounds. Um, so then the saw down here for Flasher Farms, it was a destroyed farm that was destroyed by the battles. You know, they blew it up basically, so it's burned down, there's busted walls, whatever. And since he was part of the Corps of Engineers, I used an old saw that my grandfather actually owned and printed that right onto there. And placed it with some fresh sawdust that I darkened up through some leaves in there. I wanted to give it that appearance. So this one actually had that sense of um, a smell instead of sound. So you'd get up next to it and you could smell the fresh sawdust. You could smell those dried leaves. 
all that. So I was trying to interact with the senses in a way for these ones. And then the other one, it was a series of three, was this. It's a lantern. I did the same thing. I transferred images onto them. So two of the images are from the um, album he had, and then two of them are actually family photographs that are old. The two images near the center are the ones from the album. The one on the left is an old family photo from my mom's side, and the one on the right is actually an old family photo from my dad's side. And there are various war times. The one from my dad's side is actually from World War II. The middle one's World War I, and then the other one is an older time. I don't know exactly when, but it's older, probably closer to Civil War era, things like that. And this one, I put a little light in it so that when you move around it, it would change the way the image looked a little. You'd see different angles, different shade, shadows, different highlights, things like that. Any questions about these ones? Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of these, yeah, I, I do a combination of those, the hands-on processes or actually taking an object and mashing it together with imagery. And I wanna do more things like this and find other family photographs and other objects and place them together as well. Can you say how you got the images on the lantern? <laughs> so this was an interesting one too. I had to basically print off the image. Well, first off, I had to measure the glass, figure out how large the image had to be, scan the film in, or the photo, whichever one it was at the time, um, print that off after measuring it to the right size, place it over the image, over the glass, cut out the shape of it so it would fit in there, and then put the acrylic medium on, which takes, you know, three layers in total. And then you have to let it sit there and dry and then use water and wipe away the paper basically. So, and this one wasn't easy because of the corners and the tight grooves. So I used pencils. I used a little brush that I could like kind of push into the corners and clear it away. We do image transfers on wood with the photo club kids every year. And I've had a class at the center for that process. But I've never seen it on glass. I love it on glass. Yes. It actually works out very well. And I actually have it here with me too. Oh my gosh. So you can kind of see with the light off, it's hard to see them. Yeah. But when you turn it on, it actually makes it a lot more visible because the light flickers as well. So it actually changes the way in which it works a little bit. We need a class in this technique. I know. <laughs> I would take this class, Michael. I would sign up right now to take this class. And, and Juliana, yeah, I, I don't know if it's... It. Juliana, I don't know if we still have stuff, but at one point there was a big stack of glass that was odd shapes that couldn't really be used for frames of the student graduation certificates and it couldn't really be used for like the wet plate collodion because I think it was either too thick or too thin for, you know, what we were, do I think it might have been too thin. Maybe there would be some application for that. Yes, we have a whole case of glass. Yeah. It's yeah, if, if you have glass, you could easily transfer onto it. And if you want, you make a small frame around it and you can put it over windows or lights or things like that. So you oh can actually God, see through it. Yeah, I was even going to say like old window frames. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yep. That's, I have actually, I want to do that. Some of that is find old window frames and the mm -hmm. idea of like houses that have burned down or they've fallen down and mm -hmm. print it on this old frame showing Maybe, you know, this is the past of what it was and what happened to it. And especially so. where it has like that interesting kind of modeling surface, how that would work with the image. That would be really cool. See, you're getting everybody's creative juices flowing here, Michael. And I'm, I'm glad. I, <laughs> <laughs> hey, if anything, that makes me happy is that I'm getting people excited and wanting to do different art processes. Great. <laughs> Yeah, Any other questions? Well, I just want to say, having seen the thing in person itself, like the documentation of it is really beautiful. 
and you know the imperfections of where like all the paper didn't come off and everything like at one point that made me feel a little OCD twitchy but it, it, <laughs> it totally works you know so yep. yeah so kind of like what you're saying is on the very far left yep. as you can see the folds in the paper where it kind of pulled itself back up while I was trying to remove the paper itself from the ink that's so. okay about like old photographs and how you're talking about this objectness of, of objects, but also the objectness of the photographs themselves. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. when we look at an old tin type or old photograph, you know, it's a different surface, it's got a different feel. So you're really bringing these things together in such a sensitive way for somebody who can't pre-visualize. I mean, really? <laughs> Maybe I know I added a comment. Sorry, I was going to say maybe that's why he's so good because he doesn't have an image already in his mind. Because like, he yeah. does it. Not limited uh, by that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put a chat in, but it looks like I lost internet for a moment and the Zoom the chat got wiped out, but I had put a comment in that said, you know, even without your own ability to sort of visualize your memories, your ability to speak through your emotions and the descriptions is so poignant that when you were talking about, you know, I think it was about your grandparents and, you know, that the, you have memories of them and you have memories of things that were significant about them, but you can't create that visual memory. But for me, it was so strong that it seems almost that, you know, the gift that you have is the ability to verbalize it in a way that helps other people create images in their mind. I mean, I don't know you or your family at all, but I had all of that swirling <laughs> around, which was amazing for me to have that experience. You're making us visualize things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy I can get other people to, you know, visualize things in different ways and maybe see the world in a different way or whatever, you know, try different things. Just, I don't know. It's learning about this myself. It was a weird process because it was made basically at the end of a semester and then I just, no class, not really working on any projects for class. It was just me and my thoughts about what was going on or what I was learning. So I think it, it helped me kind of cope with it a little bit, doing some more artwork that I could work that process in and think about it in that sense of, I'm not actually seeing it, how can I work with that in a sense. You are so articulate. <laughs> Thank you. It, so it, it makes me think about like this Memento Mori series that you did, um, you know, possibly having that exist in a book format with some of those memories written down, you know, by yourself or your grandmother or, or audio recordings of visiting with her because um, she's a lively lady. She is. She's, <laughs> she fights for everything she wants, basically. <laughs> got stories to tell and so do you so I just I'm so excited Thank about the different tracks your work can can be manifested in so yeah you need to teach some classes yeah and that's that's the thing too is no reference. <laughs> I would love to I would love to <laughs> anyone else And that is actually the end of it. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, not expected. <laughs> That's great. That's really yeah. great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. It was nice track. to meet you through this medium. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is the kind of thing where, you know, you think, okay, this is one of the silver linings because if we were opened, I would have just gone and seen your things hanging on display and missed all the layers of depth that you just imparted. So thank you. This was a treat. No problem. Yeah. It's awesome. I feel like I understand the work more, you know, even though I was, you know, witness to some of its evolution, which this was not what you were going to do at all for your book. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> 100, 360. Yeah. But it was wonderful. Wait the semester. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what comes out at VSW. My dog is barking. Sorry. 
But that's a whole nother place to experiment and you have access to all these random things. You never know what you're gonna come up with. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. I've been thinking about that too, is all the different images I can find of the city and of buildings around the city and the different objects I'll just be able to find and I can maybe make combinations that people haven't thought about in years of how they were connected. Yeah. Oh. yeah it's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was awesome. That was awesome.